lesson comes from John's Gospel, the 14th chapter. You need to remember what the setting for this is. This is Jesus' last teaching with his disciples. He's about to go into the garden and be arrested. But this is what he says to them. I've said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Do not, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God loved this story about Elijah. Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab, a king of Israel, but not a good king, and he married Jezebel, who was a worshiper of Baal, or Baal, sometimes you hear it. And her priests and Elijah have just had this big showdown. Remember that story where it's like, my God's bigger than your God. My God can do this. You know, you'd have a bumper sticker on your car that says, my God can light a fire that your God cannot. Because they have the altar set up, one for God of Israel and one for Baal. And they have an animal on each one to offer a sacrifice to their God. And... They were calling down fire from heaven. Both gods are going to light the fire and start the, the barbecue, the holy barbecue of God. And Elijah gets a little cocky and says, oh, let's pour some water on mine and see what happens then. So they cover his with water. The gods of Baal, the prophets of Baal, the priests of Baal, they dance, they sing, they, they yell, they, they do everything they can, and they try to light it up, and nothing happens. And Elijah is covered with water, and all he does is call upon the name of his Lord, and boom, the fire starts. Now, he doesn't just stop there. He kind of makes a little bit of fun of the gods of Baal. In the words of Scripture, it says, perhaps your God has turned aside, which means maybe your God is in the bathroom. That's what it means, really. So it's an insult. People would have laughed. They would have gone nuts. So Elijah has this great triumph. God is with him. But then Jezebel does not like that, and she sends a messenger saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Because he didn't just light up the fire, he killed the prophets of Baal, slayed them, every last one, lying there dead in a heap on the ground. And then he is afraid. Suddenly after this great, this great event in his life, this wonderful time when he has prevailed, God did not let him down. And he gets scared and runs away and hides. And he goes into the wilderness and he sits down under a broom tree. Always makes me think, who else sat down under a broom tree? Remember Jonah sits under the broom tree? Because God will not kill those Ninevites after he goes and he preaches them after trying to escape on the ship and they throw him over and the big fish eats. And you know that story, right? These are foundational stories that you all learned in Sunday school or VBS when you were kids. And he goes, and he's mad that God does not kill the Ninevites because they repented. And God says, then I'm going to relent and let them live. And he's like, well, then I'm just going to sit here and be mad. And then a worm comes and eats the broom tree, and it dies, and that's just another fussy prophet of the Old Testament. But not Elijah. He sits there and he prays to God. He says, let me die. I'm so tired of it all. I just want to die. Maybe you never felt that way after something big happened in your life that you just don't have the strength to keep going no matter what. Even if you've had a big triumph, you're just exhausted. You don't want to fight anymore. You just want to lie down and wait for Jesus to come. Well, what does God do? Does God do what God did when Jonah was such a little brat under the tree there? I think I have a good word to say for that one here. No. What does he do? He sends an angel. And what does the angel do? Bakes him hot bread. How many of you have ever said, I want to die. I'm so mad at the world. I'm so tired of everything. And you wake up and there's an angel who's cooked your breakfast. Hot homemade bread. Angel bread. I want to know if it's like angel food cake, but angel bread and water. Clear water there for you to drink so you get your strength back. And then he gets up and he eats and he drinks and he sends him out to do it again. And he feeds him again. And then the story that we know so well where God says, what are you up to, Elijah? What's this about, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah goes to the cave with his mantle, his scarf wrapped around his face, and he looks out, and there's this wind. Not just a wind, a wind that's splitting rocks and knocking down mountains. That's a wind, people. 
That is a tornado, probably, kind of wind. But God is not in the wind. And then the earthquake comes, and God's not in the earthquake. And the fire comes, and Elijah's watching all this from the mouth of the cave. And then the sound of sheer silence. And if you know King James Version, what is it called there? The still, small voice of God whispers to him, Why are you here, Elijah? Why are you here? That's who God is for us when we're in anxiety. Now, some of you know that I used to be a psychiatric chaplain back when I was in deaf ministry, that part of my ministry was at St. Elizabeth's Hospital working with deaf psychiatric patients, which was breaking my heart all the time. The psychiatrist on my, union put it, on my unit put it this way. She said she heard the best description of working in the hospital from a nurse who worked there, a psychiatric nurse who said, working here is like drowning in a sea of unmet human need. Think about that a moment. Drowning in a sea of unmet human need. People were there who had been told they couldn't be forgiven. People were there who were told that they were so bad that nobody ever wanted to look at them again. People were there because they heard voices telling them to do things they shouldn't do. People whose lives were just shattered by mental illness. And it was like working in a sea of unmet human need, drowning in a sea of unmet human need. Because when you're there, you're not just the chaplain of the patients, you're the chaplain of the staff as well. And sometimes these people who are so faithful in their work would be tired and run down themselves. They didn't know what to do anymore. So this is how God comes to us, isn't it? In a still small voice or the sound of sheer silence. But you've got to listen for silence because sometimes the noise of the world gets in the way, doesn't it? Maybe it's not an earthquake, literally. Maybe it's not a tornado, literally. Maybe it's not a fire literally, but sometimes we feel like we have been through the mill, don't you? Don't you sometimes feel like life is overwhelming, hurtful, painful, and just tiresome? Do you know that there is a shortage of mental health professionals in the country right now? There are people on waiting lists, especially teenagers for months and months and months, trying to see a therapist. There's a shortage of psychiatrists in the country because when the pandemic started, there were um, 40 million Americans were looking for help. And it ballooned up to 55 million Americans looking for help trying to get through the pandemic. That's for adults who pretty much have a grounding in things. But think about teenagers, those who didn't get to go to their prom or graduate, or they started college remotely. Nothing seemed right to them. And they're still struggling to get by. It's not just kids, it's us as well, isn't it? We have a God who listens to us, who listens to us. We just have to learn to listen to God. Because who did God send to Elijah when he was at his lowest point? Elisha came. Because Elijah said, God, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And God said, you know, you've been faithful to me. I'm going to take care of you. And that's why he got in that little chariot and swooped up to heaven. I always sing, swing low, sweet chariot, come for to carry me home. That's why when you go to a Jewish Seder dinner, there is a place setting for Elijah because he's going to come back one day before the Messiah. Elijah will be back, they believe. But we don't wait, do we? And I read something interesting that said our grandparents, now will be your great-grandparents for some of you who are younger, called it Sabbath. Our parents or grandparents called it Sunday. We call it what? The weekend because we don't like to make time for God. We like to find time for God. Finding time for God and find, is like trying to wait until you can afford to have children. If you wait to have, afford to have children, what are you going to do? You're going to die childless, right? Nobody can afford children. You all know how expensive you guys are? You're very expensive, but we love you anyway, and we wouldn't wait for you. We want you to be part of our lives. What's the problem with trying to find time for someone or something important to you? You'll never find it, will you? You've got to make time. You've got to make time for your family. You've got to make time for your spouse. You have to make time for your children. You have to make time for your parents. You have to make time for your friends. You have to make time for God and Jesus Christ or you're never going to know what you can have with God. We're never going to have peace of mind if we just let God stay out to the side. Look what he says. Jesus himself says to them, he is about to be arrested. The disciples have no idea what's going to hit him in just a few moments, but Jesus says to them what? 
I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you these things while I'm still here, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send you my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. This is a man who is about to be arrested. He's about to be beaten. He's about to be nailed to a cross. He's about to be killed and put into a borrowed tomb. And still he says to them, don't let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. Paul says in the great hymn to the Philippian church, Rejoice, I tell you, rejoice. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God sent us the Holy Spirit so that we could have the Spirit of God with us all the time. God comes to us in so many ways, not necessarily in the big technicolor earthquake and fire and wind, but in the still small voice that speaks to our hearts. If we listen for God, but you've got to make time to listen. So how are we doing this during Advent this year? I think the world's really hurting right now. The world is hurting. People are at a low point. People are scared. They think this pandemic's never going to end because now we have a pandemic and the flu season and RSV. All these things hitting us at one time. Prices in the store are up so much. I went to the grocery store yesterday with Ivan. We were trying to buy light bulbs. There was a light bulb for $21, one light bulb. I said, I'll sit in the dark before I'm going to pay $21 for a light bulb. That's nuts. And when we went out to buy the shoes for the shoe drive for Padonia Elementary School, the 50 penny gave us $300 to shop with. It only bought, um, didn't even buy 30 pairs of shoes for that. And I bought two pairs myself, $38 for little bitty shoes for children. And I thought, how do people who struggle make ends meet? There's a lot of anxiety in the world right now. We have a God who's bigger than all anxiety, who's bigger than all worry, who's bigger than all problems that we can face. We just have to make time for God in our lives. So if you want peace in the world, next week we're going to talk about peace in families, and that's always a lot of fun, isn't it? Because sometimes families are broken up by silly things. I've seen children never speak to each other again over who got mom's teapot and her will. But if you don't start with peace in your own heart, with peace in your own soul, you're never going to know peace with anyone else. So next week we're going to talk about peace and families. Then Bill Brown's going to be here the week that I'm in New Jersey. Bill Brown's going to be talking about peace in the church. Our own denomination is at the point of splitting up. And we can't get along with other denominations either, can we? We can't agree on anything other than Jesus is Lord, which should be the beginning of our talks. And sometimes that's the end of them. And we're going to move from that to, to the greater community of our nation, peace in our nation. And finally, on Christmas Eve, we're going to listen to the angels who sang that God's will for humankind is peace on earth. Peace on earth. But if we don't start with our own hearts, turning to God, looking to God, calling out to God, and sometimes just being quiet and letting God speak to our hearts, we'll never know peace with anyone else. So how are you going to do that this week? I think you're going to make some time to pray. I always tell people when they say, I don't have time to pray. Just I wish I had time to pray. I get so busy, I don't have time to pray. Anybody here have an alarm clock? You know, back in the day, they had these clocks that had buzzers on them. You have an alarm clock? Wow, you're a dinosaur, aren't you, girl? Most of you have phones, don't you, that have alarms on them? If you have a phone, you know you can set your snooze alarm for as long as you want it. You can set it for four hours if you want it. Wouldn't get you to work on time, but it would be nice. I always tell people, why don't you set your alarm ahead enough for your snooze alarm and just hit your snooze and pray until it goes off. That could be six minutes a day that you could spend in prayer or longer. Or read scripture. I'm going to start a Bible study this week on Tuesdays. It's going to be a drop-in study. You don't have to sign up for every week. It's going to be the entire book of Luke. Kara's got the study guides in her office for you if you want one. Just come and bring your lunch. Come downstairs. We're going to sit at the, in the conference room and we're going to study Luke's gospel from beginning to end. It's going to take us months to do it, so whenever you want to come. Then starting in the first of the year, we're going to be meeting at um, Ashland Cafe, 8 o'clock Saturday mornings. 
I have one before Christmas on the 17th of December because that's the only free Saturday I have in December. But come out now and then. Spend time looking at scripture with a group of people. You will learn more if you study with others than if you study with yourself. You can study with yourself. We're going to put it on, every day we'll put it on Facebook. We will put what we're going to read that day on Facebook so you all can study with us. Make time for God. Make time. Don't wait to find time. Make time for God. Or if that's too much to ask you, then do Lexio Divina. I'm going to ask you now, call out your favorite scripture passage. Your favorite line of scripture that when you're in trouble comes to you and calms you down. Maybe you have a line of scripture. Y'all know the Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need, right? That's a good one to start with. What else? What are your, what are your verses that, that speak to your hearts? Oh my goodness. Some of you have verses you go First to. First Peter chapter 1. What is it, Kobe? Uh, Amen. Anybody else have one? Oh, you got to get yourself some scripture, boys and girls. I'm telling you what, it'll come to you when you need it. You will need it, and it will come to you, and it will calm your heart. But you've got to go to God. You've got to make time for God in your life. If you want peace in your heart, you're going to have to make time for God. Peace that passes understanding. Peace that... Christ gives it the world, not like the world gives, because the world gives us peace, doesn't it, for short periods of time, and then it's gone again. The peace that Christ will put in your heart will stay with you every day of your life. But you have to practice your faith. You have to share with others, because Elijah, look at him. The angel came to him in his need. I'm sure you know people who are struggling right now. You can be the angel for them, either with a hot loaf of bread or a loaf of bread from the grocery store or some little something that you... Call them up and remind them that they're loved. Or if you need help, call someone up and say to them, I'm struggling right now. Could I talk to you? We are, we've been taught as a society to keep our problems to ourselves and not share anything, which is why I share openly probably too much sometimes with folks. But I'm going to model for you what it is to need help because I have been in therapy before. I'm in therapy right now. I was treated for depression in the past and took a medication for depression because it was a hard season of life for me. I have no stigma about that whatsoever because I was a psychiatric chaplain. I saw what help does when you ask for help and you get help. It makes your life whole again. In the name of Jesus Christ, I'm going to tell you all, if you need to talk to somebody, call me up. That's what you pay me for. I go to meetings and all that stuff, but sometimes people will say, I really need to talk to you, Reverend, and... I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. God called me to do that stuff. The other stuff, the meetings and the pancakes and everything else is just on top of what I do. But ask someone to walk with you when you're in trouble, when you're in need, and you will find Christ in that relationship as well. Now, poor Elijah, I felt so bad for him, but I know what he feels like sometimes, don't y'all? You all know what it is to just sometimes get so down that you don't know which way to turn. But turn to God and know that God is there listening. God's not going to slam you down to the ground in a tornado or a fire or an earthquake, but God's going to listen to you. God's going to heal you. God's going to raise you up to the glory of Christ our Savior, whose coming we know is promised to us. Amen, amen, amen. We're going to sing what